You may have wondered what happened to the booster project I talked about in videos number 126 and 128. Over the course of the last few weeks I made some good progress and I expect the booster to become available by the end of this year. In this video I'm going to have a closer look at the DCC interface port and how the booster communicates with the rest of the layout. Hello everyone and welcome to the IOTT channel. I am Hans Tanner. A special welcome to all first time visitors and welcome back to everyone else. I'm happy to see you and thank you for your support of the channel. Oh, just in case you are not yet a subscriber, please click the subscribe button below and hit the bell icon. It's free, but it puts you in a premium seat when new videos come out. In the first video about this booster project, I showed you a modified version of the DCC aux shield I made for connecting the DCC input to the booster and feed it to the Arduino. This was working great for the initial development work, but to me it was only a first quick and dirty solution and I wanted something more elegant. First of all, I really disliked the form factor. Just imagine, all boards of the booster nicely fit the Arduino footprint and then there is this ugly board on top of the stack sticking out about one inch and at the same time limiting the access to the power supply and track connectors of the first power shield board. The second problem with that first prototype is that it only supports DCC. As I was adding features to the booster software, I realized that it would be beneficial to also be able to send messages to the command station or a computer, at least as long as the booster is connected to a local net system. Furthermore, it would give access to more message types than just turnouts and signal commands which can be communicated via DCC. It would be possible, for example, to set the polarity of an auto-reversing section based on a block detector input received via Loconet. First, I thought that could be done by just using the Loconet over TCP Wi-Fi connection, but then I decided to add a wired Loconet connection as well. And that made it necessary to create a separate board as there was not enough room on the aux shield for a Loconet interface. So I decided to make a separate interface shield with DCC and Loconet interface. And because that interface can be used for many other purposes than just a booster, I called it the Tinkerface shield, an Arduino shield for all tinkerers who want to build a function board using an Arduino and connecting it to DCC or Loconet or both. Let's have a closer look at the Tinkerface Shield hardware. The board is about half the size of an Arduino Uno and the pinout of the headers covers the most important pins of the Arduino. Pin header 1 has all 6 analog inputs, pin header 2 carries V in, 2 times ground and 5 volts. On the other side of the board we have GPIOs 0 to 7 on pin header 3 and GPIOs 8 and 9 on pin header 4. The remaining IO pins are not replicated on the board but they are easily accessible using Dupont wires. On the input side there are two Loconet sockets and a DCC plug. If you connect it to a Loconet system, the board will get DCC from the Loconet connection, so there is no need for an extra DCC wire. On the other hand, if you are using a non-Loconet system, you can feed the track signal to the DCC input, which can handle track voltages of up to 28 volts without problems. There are several jumpers to configure the board based on the requirements of your project. I will cover them in a minute when showing you the schematics. Since the Tinkerface shield sits on the Arduino stack, I will also provide an IOTT cube frame for it. It will be an extra cover the size of the Tinkerface shield and will have screw openings to screw it to the cover of the lower shield, either a red hat shield cover when using a DCC aux board or a flat top cover when using it directly on the Arduino. 
As always, I will make the cover frame available on the Tinkercad webpage listed in the description and it will be available by the time the Tinker Face Shield is added to the Tindy Store. Now let's have a look at the schematics starting with the Loconet interface. This is basically the same circuit I am using for the standalone Loconet interface and the Loconet part of the Red Hat. The Loconet signal is picked up from the Loconet connector and fed into a comparator to determine the signal state. The output is then wired to GPIO8 of the Arduino, which can be disconnected by removing the jumper labeled J12. A second wire goes via selector H1 to pin 4 of the growth port connector. Jumper J11 allows for adding a Zener diode to limit the pin voltage to 3.3 volts depending on the connected microcontroller. Jumper J5 can be used to connect V-in of the Arduino to the current source, which then makes the interface the Loconet master. Jumper J13 finally is used to connect Arduino pin 6 to the transmit signal of the Loconet interface, so that the Arduino can send out Loconet messages. The same wire is connected to pin 3 of the growth port, which means that both the Arduino and the microcontroller connected to the growth port can access the Loconet network to send messages. If you have done some Arduino programming for Loconet before, you recognize that the pin numbers used to connect the Arduino are the same that are used by the standard Loconet Arduino library. So using the interface with the library is really simple. On the DCC side, as shown here, I am using a differential input to generate two inverse signals DCC A and DCC B. As briefly explained in video number 126, this approach has the advantage that the timing of the signal is maintained. When using an optocoupler as input, one half of the signal will typically be stretched slightly due to the activation threshold value of the optocoupler and some hysteresis effects. You can see the effects on the timing in this screenshot I showed in video number 126. The second advantage of the differential input is that you can build it with high impedance. When using an optocoupler input, the current needed to activate it is typically around 10 mA with a forward voltage of about 1.5 volts. If the input should work with track voltages as low as maybe 10 volts for N scale and as high as 28 volts for a garden railroad layout, this causes a problem for correctly dimensioning the series resistor for the optocoupler, as explained in video number 43. When using a differential input, the current can be much lower, and therefore the input works with a much wider range of track voltages. There is another advantage of the differential input, which is very valuable when building a booster. If there is no input, both signals DCCA and DCCB are of the same polarity. And as a result, the booster element driven by DCCA and B is automatically turned off. This is not only a safety feature, but it is also needed to support the signal cutout required for local address reporting via Railcom. On the schematics, we see the two comparators that receive the DCC signal and generate the output. Just to be on the safe side, I added an additional transistor layer to generate the 5 volts square wave that then is fed via the exclusive NOR gates to the Arduino IO pins 2 and 3 if jumpers J9 and J10 are installed. So on the Arduino, you have the choice. You can either use the differential input on pins 2 and 3, as I do for the booster, or you can use one single DCC input either from pin 2 or pin 3 to implement a DCC decoder. Again here, if you are using the NMRA DCC standard library for Arduino, you will use pin 2 as DCC pin in most of the cases, so using the interface makes your life quite easy. You can also see that one of the DCC signals is routed from here 
via jumper, selector H1 to pin 4 of the growth port connector. So any connected microcontroller can be used to receive either LocoNet or DCC signals. The only functionality I am not able to implement on the board is the capability to send ACK pulses for service mode programming. Doing that would require a bridge rectifier and a current source and I simply don't have enough room on the board for these components. But then, on the other hand, who wants to use service mode programming if you can conveniently change the configuration in the Arduino setup? And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and you are now motivated to start your own Tinkerer projects for your layout. It's a lot of fun when things come together and start to work. And even more so if you understand how it works because you have created it yourself. As always, please let me know your thoughts in the comment section and click the like button below. It only takes a second to do so, but it helps a long way to support the IoTT channel in general and to promote this video to other model railroad tinkerers, because YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.